Uh, let's open up our Bibles to Galatians chapter 1 this evening. Galatians chapter 1. While you're turning there, reminder, um, there will be no power in the building tomorrow. The electrician is confirmed to be here on Thursday. Uh, and so the electrician will be here Thursday and possibly part of the day Friday doing electrical work. Reed is here and can update that if I've shared anything incorrectly. Uh, but there will be no power in the building tomorrow. So if you do have to come here, make sure you bring a flashlight and a power source. Um, uh, I, again, uh, so those updates will be going on in the church. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1 this evening. So we get started looking at Paul's life. Galatians 1.15 says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them uh, which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. Let's open a word of prayer. Lord, as we bow for you tonight, help us to see... Uh, the solitary path on which Paul spent much of his time. And while we might say that he did some amazing things with planting churches and being on missionary journeys and mentioning many, many brothers and sisters in his letters, yet, Lord, we see a path of preparation, uh, a, a lonely path at times. And yet may we realize that things will not be as glamorous as we dream them to be, but it's our privilege and joy to serve you. We ask all these things in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Early on in Paul's life, and or at least in his ministry, he spent at least three years alone with God, apparently away from active ministry. Many theologians have theorized that this was kind of his form of seminary, that after he had met the Lord, that he went and, and set, went apart and studied the Old Testament and began to really look at things through a different lens and was looking to understand all of those things that he had previously missed. And so uh, I know many, many young people today who want to go into the ministry, young men who say, I want to go into the ministry, young ladies who say, I want to be pastor's wives or missionary wives, and, and they desire a good thing, but they, they have a lofty uh, view of their pastor or other missionaries, and they have a lofty view of others, and, and they expect as soon as they put their hand up to go that, that others will have the same view of them. And, but the reality is simply this, is that when you train for the ministry, and even when you serve in the ministry, uh, it will not be a, a very pleasant experience most of the time. It, it will be challenging. It'll be difficult. And, and that's the same way it is for a believer. Uh, things are not always easy. Things are often difficult. They're often challenging. You know, we're, we are told to die to self daily. You know, we, we are called upon to do these, um, you know, horrific things, uh, which most people would say, well, if it feels good, do it. And we know as believers, if it feels good, it's probably wrong. And so we, we just have to kind of look at it through a whole nother lens. I'm not saying it's that way all the time, but just in general, you have to assume you're wrong half the time and figuring out which half it is is the challenge. But with Paul's solitary path, his calling led to preparation. And many people today say, as long as you're called, it doesn't matter if you're prepared. It doesn't matter if you're qualified. It doesn't matter if you have ethics. It doesn't matter if you have integrity. It doesn't matter as long as your intentions are pure. And, and, and you know, it, we wouldn't allow that with a doctor. You know, uh, uh, imagine, you know, being put on the table for operations. And I've had several for kidney stones over the years. And, and, and you know, the last thing I want to hear going under uh, general anesthesia is, is hand me the saw, you know, or, uh, you know, whoops, or what's that, or, you know... Uh, and so there's a number of things you don't want to see. I remember one time I was strapped down to the table and they began to pick up the tools to work on me before I was out and they saw the look in my eyes and I was like, let me up. And they were like, he's still awake, he's still awake. And they pressed the plunger and I was knocked out. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of times we think, well, as long as your intentions are pure, well, that doesn't work with doctors and that doesn't work even with construction. That doesn't work with mechanics. Uh, it, it doesn't work with electricians, you know. We, people need to be qualified. They need to know what they're doing. They need to handle it well. And so uh, really the authority doesn't come from, that's really the, the concern is where does the authority come from? Not from education. It comes from the Lord. 
but we need to be competent. We, we need to be approved workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we, we need to be people who are skillful with the word of God. And so uh, we don't know much about the details of what was going on in Paul's life, but God had a special plan, and that plan required preparation and provision. And can I just say that we often get impatient with God? You know, sometimes we, we get impatient because why is God doing this to me? What? Why is God delaying what I want? You know, what, why can't I find someone to marry? You know, a single person might ask. Or a, a young couple might say, why can't we have children as easily as others? Or, or, or you know, a, a person in the ministry will call me up and say, why is it so hard? You know, why, why did my loved one die? Why did my child die? You know, what, why did I get cancer? Why did my loved one get cancer? You know, all of these things happen and, and, and you know, Everyone has some sort of thing that they're going through. And I, I just want to challenge us that we are, oftentimes we don't know what God is doing. And we get impatient with him. And even when we know God's leading in our life, we have a calling. Like, hey, I, I'm called to, to do this or that in my life. I, I know God has a plan for me. And when God doesn't operate on our timetable in a way we expect, we get very frustrated. We, we get very disappointed. We, we don't uh, wait patiently upon the Lord. We, we think once we understand, or at least we think we know what God wants for us, we think the path should be smooth sailing and immediate. And that's not how it works. The reality is we need to get on the path that God has laid for us. We need to stay in that will every day. And we'll be where we're supposed to be in five years and 10 years and 20 years. Uh, I remember when I, in my generation growing up, the question was, well, what's God's will for my life, you know? And, and today it's like, well, I want it right now. And, and the reality is simply this, that if you'll get in God's will today and stay there, you'll be where you need to be in five years. You'll be where you need to be in 10 years, in 20 years, in, in 30 years, in 50 years. We just need to serve God faithfully today. And sometimes we, we struggle with that waiting and being on God's timetable. And God has a special time and place for us but along that way, he has things that he wants to accomplish in us, and it's in the wilderness. I, I call my, my background the armored truck wilderness, you know, and, and so I had a friend in the ministry, he called it the drywall wilderness. And so it's in the wilderness that we learn these skills. We see what God is working on us. An aspiring athlete will not immediately make the Olympics. I mean, if you meet someone who has a desire to play sports, you know, freshmen don't often normally become starters, you know, they spend a lot of time on the bench, you know, or, you know, sometimes a freshman comes in and they might have some skill and they think they're going to take over the team. And it's like, that's not really going to happen, you know, especially if there are seniors involved. An aspiring athlete for the Olympics, I mean, if you have this desire, well, you know, you watch TV and think, I could do that. Not likely. Uh, you get an idea of how God prepares us. And whenever we watch an Olympic athlete row or run or, you know, do whatever it is they're doing, you know, skiing or luging or, you know, whatever the case may be, winter or summer Olympics, you, you might think to yourself, I could do that. But if you've never likely met Olympic athletes. And so it, let alone spend a week in their sneakers. It's not just that Olympians are born with a certain set of physiological gifts, although a lot of them have uh, just a predispensation to athleticism. They, they just have that, that skill set that some of us, talking about myself, don't have. But it's also their commitment and perhaps most importantly their, their level of dedication to training. People don't know the process that athletes undertake in their individual sports to reach the Olympic level. Uh, Jim Ochowitz uh, who competed in the 72 Olympic Games and coached the 2000 and 2004 men's professional road racing team said. He said, you get there by sticking it out. There are a lot of people that try and give up. And so uh, trainers say it is common for athletes to dedicate four to eight years of training before they even make the, the Olympic team. And if you're waiting, if you're out there and you say, I'm waiting on God to answer this prayer, I'm waiting on God to to show me what I should do. I'm waiting on God for my career or for jobs or for, for health or for loved ones or for a spouse or for children or for you know some other major thing, to some paperwork issue, some government thing to open up in your life. I just want to challenge you that it's best to take uh, to 
to believe and to know that God is at work doing something good and to take advantage of every opportunity to grow and be used by the Lord. And God's wisdom and ways are much better than ours. And he is working and his purpose and his way and his schedule is always best. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The reality is, if you're out there saying, well, God didn't do things the way I want, here's my answer, praise God. You know, so, sometimes we say, well, God didn't do what I want. I didn't get what I want. And, and pastor, what's the key to get God to give me what I want? You got it all wrong. The key is to want what God wants for you. Uh, the key is to put him first and, and let him be in charge. Paul, Paul's solitary path led him first to Arabia. Now it let, leads him to Damascus. In Acts 26, verses 19 through 20, if you want to turn there, Acts 26, 19 through 20 says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Paul knew he would preach in distant, far-off places. Paul, Paul knew uh, about what was coming for him, and it, it seems obvious that first he was trying to reach his own countrymen. Paul always had a burden for the Jews, even though uh, from the beginning in Acts chapter 9, as we looked at it, it says that he was going to have to suffer and be a witness to the Gentiles. And, and so we may have dreams of what we would like to do for God. We may have dreams of being the next this or the next that or of building a big church or having books in our name and having becoming some well-known, amazing person. But the reality is we just need to be faithful and content in serving God with what he's blessed us with. Serve God where we are with what we have. And we need to be willing to set aside all of our hopes, all of our plans, all of our dreams, and just put ourselves in the center of God's perfect will. Just be content with where we are. Just be happy to know him and be used of him in whatever it is. There's nothing that brings joy to my heart like when I see somebody serving in the church at night or on some other time. And, you know, don't be surprised if I show up and just say, hey, how are you doing? And, you know, I'll catch somebody cleaning the church and they just all smile as I say, Pastor, it's just, it's my joy. You know, this is my ministry, you know. And, and a lot of people do things not to be well known, but, you know, that, that brings a smile to my face, into my heart, to see people saying, you know what, I love doing whatever it is. I love working with children. I love working in the nursery. I, I love making meals. I love taking out the trash. I, I, I love teaching Sunday school. I love working with the teens. I, I love working with college students, and I love working in the AV, or what, whatever it is. When, when I see someone doing something, and they just have a smile, and they just say, you know, pastor, it's just a joy to serve God. I want to challenge us that we need to be joyful in whatever God's given to us. And so many people in Christianity think that if they would do something else other than how God made them, they would have more joy. Let me just challenge you. You'll have joy in doing what God's given to you right now. And when you're faithful in little, you're also faithful in much. And so I always work with giving people small tasks. I like to give them small tasks and see how they perform. And you know, if you give someone a big task and take it away, you're bound to hurt their feelings. But if you give them a little task and another little task and a little task and, and just see how they perform, ease them in, so to speak, uh, th then you know how they'll perform in the big stuff. And so we may have dreams, but it's best to surrender to God's perfect will. And when you do, you will be glad. As a child, did you ever play with Play-Doh? I remember the days when Play-Doh was considered like an extravagance. You would actually make your own Play-Doh. Uh, have you ever like had a, a roommate or somebody that worked with pottery? My grandmother enjoyed pottery, and she had a kiln. And uh, one of my groomsmen, he, he took pottery classes on, on the side. He was a major electrician guy who then, uh, his dad was in the ministry. He got called to the ministry. He made some coffee cups. I still have at home uh, as a wedding gift. And, and he would talk about this often, and 
it was just kind of his relaxation thing. I think actually it's where he went to meet girls in the, in the arts building. But anyway, um, uh, if you've ever worked with Play-Doh or clay, you know that you can mold it and shape it, assuming that it's usable stuff. As long as it's usable, you can mold it and shape it into any shape you are capable of making it into. It's literally based upon if the clay is good and usable, then it's on the skills of the master to what he can make it into. And God compares himself to the master designer in our lives and that we are like the clay and that he would mold the vessel into something useful. Isaiah 64, verse 8. Forgive me, stomach is upset. Isaiah 64, verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all the work of thy hand. And just to encourage you with this thought, we are all works in progress. And we might look at other people and say, ah, I'm better than you are. Here's the reality. God doesn't look at you as you are. He looks at you as what he plans for you to be. And so whenever you don't see what you want to see or when you wonder why he's still working, the reality is, is because, one, he sees you worth it, and two, he has a plan for you, and he sees what you will be versus what you are. And so let's always be, be mindful that we are all works in progress. Uh, one of the ways that God molds us is the same way that he molded Paul through the time spent with him. And friends, as you spend time with the Lord, we may not have extended time away like Paul did, where he spent years upon years. I, I look back in my Bible college and seminary days, and I realize what a blessing those seven years of extended study. I remember... Uh, when I was in Bible college and, and stopping for the day and just thinking to myself, you know, I have spent 12 or more hours today in the Bible. You know, you get up in the morning and you have devotions. And then you go to classes for about seven, eight hours in the day. You go to chapel in the midst of that. Then you get done and you have to do homework for another, you know, three, four hours, maybe more uh, of homework. And, and then you have to go to uh, your, your prayer group every evening and spend time in prayer and sharing what God's doing in your life. And then you go to bed and then you get up and do it all over again. You, you realize, you know, a after a few days of that, that I have spent so much time in the Bible and you do that day in and day out and day in and day out. And that's Monday through Friday. And then you have Sunday, which is church all day, at least it should be. A and then, you know, Saturday would often be some sort of either work event or something related to that. And you realize six, seven days a week, all day long, is what you're doing in preparation for the ministry. And that's good training for real life. Um, and, and so not everyone can live that life. You're out there going, well, pastor, we're not all pastors. I know. And, and that's a shame, but I, I know. But as we think about this, we need to spend daily time with God. We need to spend daily time in his word. We, we need to spend daily time thinking about him. It needs to be something that we're always ruminating on in the back of our minds. And, and I understand that we all have to earn a living somehow. And I know that we have to do the dishes and pay the bills and go, do our jobs and empty the trash and all the other non-glamorous things. But somewhere in the back of our mind, we ought to be ruminating about God, you know, praying for others, thinking about others, asking God for directions. And it's hard to stop our busy schedules. But have you ever felt tired? frustrated? Has your joy ever been gone? You know, soon we find ourselves struggling to do even little things that God has called us to do. And, and people will say, well, you know, I'd rather wear out than rust out. Well, and I mean, okay, I mean, that sounds good until you realize they're both out, okay? They're both useless. And the reality is we ought to be in use to the Lord, but the more use you are, the more time it takes in the repair shop. I was talking with somebody the other day, I forget who, and we were talking about repairs and how to, how to do repairs on, on big engines and, and big vehicles. I think it was a friend of mine that's a Navy contractor I was discussing this with, and, and I shared with him, yeah, absolutely. You know, the more, stu the more t hours you get on it, the more, more use it gets. You know, eventually you got to put it in the repair shop and you got to do a full rebuild. And, you know, of course, he and I are talking about things and um, – things that we can't really talk about publicly, but we we're talking about these different things with each other. And uh, I want to challenge us as believers that when you are useful to the Lord, you will need to spend time in the repair shop of the word and in prayer and in devotions. It's not just church, although that helps, uh, but you need to spend time personally and privately 
walking with the Lord. And I think many times our families, our lives, our, our, our Christian people, our churches don't have joy because we're not spending time with the Lord. Matthew 14, 23 says, When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to a mountain apart to pray. When the evening was come, he was there alone. Luke 5, 16 says, And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Have you ever been in a car with someone who didn't like to stop for gas? Uh, I, I remember when I was a, a new youth pastor, there was someone that I worked for that did not see the value in repairing church vehicles. Um, and, and so a, as a result, both church vans had gas gauges that were broken. And so uh, you would just kind of have to dead reckon how many miles you've driven, how many hours you've driven as to when you needed to stop for gas. And I remember one time saying, hey, um, before we took a long multi-hour trip, you know, I think it was about four hours one way, we need to stop for gas because, you know, you drove it the other day. He's like, oh, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. I'm like, are you sure? Because, you know, you did this and this and I, I didn't fill it up. Have you filled it up? He's like, oh, we'll be fine. And so we get in the vehicles and I'm following them along in the other van. And all of a sudden, guess what happens? You know, you know, he, he's like, the engine is sputtering. Yep. And then, and, and then it pulls over and it dies. And guess what? It's out of gas, and you're in the middle of nowhere. You know, there's no, and, and prior to this, you're driving along, and there's gas stations every exit. And then all of a sudden, as soon as you run out, there's no gas station for like half an hour. And, and so um, what happens? Because people are unwilling to spend a few moments or even a few dollars, because they're unwilling to get vehicles maintained properly or because they're unwilling to take time to do what's necessary, they, they think, I can get just a little more. I can get just a little more. And then all of a sudden, you've lost hours and hours and hours because of these mishaps. And so I just want to challenge you that we need to be tapped into the power source. I want to challenge you that we need to remember that we need the Lord's help all the time. In John 15, verses 1 through 5, it says, I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, to accept it, abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. Staying connected to your Savior, the power source, is vital to have a fruitful life and a productive ministry. If you long to, you, to be used by God, if you long to love God, to know God, there will be many, many times of solitude. It will be lonely. It will be hard. It will be difficult. And Paul's preaching was amazing, sure. But there are times in service to the Lord when things will get harder and you will need preparation. You will need dependence. It will be difficult. You won't see results you want to see. There will be many different seasons but well, what's proof you're in the battle? It's scars. It's not, it's not awards. It's not duplicating some other church in a far off place. It's not having your way here. No. Proof you're in the battle is scars. Psalms 37, 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. We need to let God direct our way and trust him as he has a plan for us during the times when we don't see what he's doing. Even when we don't understand, especially when we don't understand, that's when we ought to trust him more, not less. So friends, remember, what kind of God do we serve? A great one? The King of kings and Lord of lords? The only one true God? Or are you better? And every time we doubt God, we literally are taking God off the throne of our lives and putting ourselves in his place when we ought to trust in him completely. Let's close with a prayer, Lord. We bow before you. We thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, that we made it through this. I just pray, Lord, that you would keep the church people safe, help those that are not feeling well, like Andy. I pray for Brother Jim, who has been having these chronic pains and headaches. I pray for Auntie Annette, who is in such severe pain. Uh, Lord, there are many, many more heartbreaking things going on in, in the church body. And you know every need before we even ask it. 
Lord, we just ask that you would guide and direct our steps, be with the building upgrades that are going on this week. Lord, I pray that they would go well, that all things would be ready for the church to be used for RU on Friday evening and for the ladies on Saturday and for church on Sunday. Just pray, Lord, that you'd help us the days ahead as there is much going on, and I thank you for those that are coordinating and working behind the scenes. We ask you to be honored and glorified. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.